name is Alan Ohashi, and I live in Silver Sage Village, which is across the street from Wild Sage. And I've been collaborating along with uh, Jim Leach, who is my across the sidewalk neighbor, and Lincoln Miller, wherever he got to, here he is. And Brian Bowen, where's Brian? Brian Bowen from Caddis Collaborative on a little project uh, that can be, the idea is, is, it, is a, a model that maybe could be replicated here as well as other places where housing prices are a little bit expensive. And it's an innovative approach to melding co-op housing, largely rental with home ownership, which is a condo model through co-housing. And um, I guess, since we, we're not very many, I was thinking maybe we could just uh, introduce ourselves really quickly. And then in the spirit of co-housing and, and, and getting to know one another better than just, I like to read books. So how about if we say what kind of bread we ate when we were growing up? How about that? All right. I'm Alan, and the kind of bread I grew up eating was Wonder Bread and flour tortillas. I'm Brian. Um, I live here at Wild Sage, and uh, I'm going to go with soba pias. Wow. Hi, I'm Jeff. I live in Aria Co-Housing in Denver, and I am another Wonder Bread family. Yeah, it was a Welch's grape jelly and Skippy peanut butter. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lincoln. Uh, I'm the executive director of Boulder Housing Coalition. Uh, the bread, we would have matzah, me and my pops, and then we would put uh, butter on it, and then we like to dip that in our tea. I'm Jim. I live across this, the street with Brownie, and uh, uh, I grew up with uh, Holland Rusk, uh, although there was a lot of Wonder Bread thrown in, too. <laughs> My mother was Dutch. All right, thanks for sharing that. And in the spirit of community building, this is the kind of stuff that we will uh, be doing when you all decide that you want to build, you want to buy into this, uh, this project. With no uh, further ado, I'll turn the program over to Jim Leach, who is a uh, I'm uh, going to make a brief presentation about uh, the project, and then what we'll do is we'll have some Q&A afterwards. Kind of, it's kind of a focus group to kind of get a feel for your thoughts about uh, the project and its workability and its feasibility and whether or not it's some place you would uh, choose to live. So I'm, I'm involved with Wonderland Hill Development Company. So I am playing the, the role of the, the uh, developer of the project until you guys take over. I'm also trying to be retired. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we put this little presentation together. It'll, it'll go pretty fast because a lot of it is uh, the stuff we use in co-housing. So if, if it's going fast, you can come back and, and catch it some other time. But what we're really promoting is a, co a, a uh, community-based neighborhood. And uh, we've been doing that, Wonderland's been doing that for uh, the last 20 years with co-housing. but. Coming together with co the co-op concept was really interesting. It, um, hmm. I've got a little thing in front of this. So uh, sustainable urban lifestyles was it's really about, and we targeted uh, a particular site that is going to become available uh, through the city housing uh, department sometime later this year. We're using this as an example. We're really exploring the concept. This could go on another site in, this, in a similar location. The nice thing about this site is it's very walkable. Uh, the transit center is across the street. Uh, it's a perfect site if there's a possibility that we can make an advance in terms of getting rid of the automobile out of our life or out of dominating our lives, this would be the site. Basically, what we're looking at is, you know, okay, who's, who's going to live in this kind of a project, an urban project in a, a town like Boulder that's trying to become more um, progressive from a transit standpoint and uh, also struggling with affordable housing. And uh, I think it's the same market we've always had for co-ops. It's a cultural creatives, people that are community-oriented, see the value in community, uh, and uh, and then uh, people that are into uh, substantial uh, sustainable downsizing, which because I, I could see uh, seniors uh, going to wanting to live in a community like this. What it is, it's a combination of co-housing and co-op units. The co-ops would be rental, 
and and then the co-housing would be uh, condominiums where you own your own unit and you purchase it. Uh, at least at this point, that's the concept. Co-op is used for all kinds of, from affordable housing all the way up to these million dollar uh, apartments, but that's an apartment type of co-op. What we're talking about here is one where people do not have a kitchen in their unit. Their unit is a one room bedroom and a bath maybe down the hall. Uh, there's different variations on it. L let me get further into this, but I don't want to get a discussion going here. So why are we doing this? Boulder needs it right now, and, and it's a, a progressive way of looking at where our lifestyle is really probably going to go. And it can be done, we think, uh, as affordable as any kind of housing in, in Boulder now, especially when you consider the advantage of the community part of it. Uh, it could be a pretty progressive investment, too. Uh, how we're going to do it is, is, this is right out of the co-housing book, collaborative, uh, with community building, sharing the some of the development risk with the actual people that are going to be living here and some of the uh, the uh, advantages or uh, development profits, so to speak. So let me quickly go through. I'm going to go through these fast because uh, this is just some slides we put together. It, co co this co-living concept really involves the participation of the future residents in the design process and in how this community is set up. So it's it's a, a bit of a do-it-yourself community. The financial model is one of open book, partnering and uh, sharing the risk. Uh, I'll get into the, the risk sharing for buyers and renters is, is pretty well controlled. Co-housing is, or the co-living we're seeing is, is in this case at least, is really about how sustainable can we get, uh, both in terms of economic, social, and environmental sustainability. Uh, can we get rid of the automobile for at least some of the households? Can we decouple the automobile from what you pay for your unit so you don't have to pay for parking a car and you don't have to pay for uh, storing cars? Co-living is also about harvesting the diversity you get in a group. Any group that, that we've ex I've experienced in co-housing, and I'm sure it'll be even more diverse when you combine the two together. You've got people with all different interests and talents. You always get at least one or two really high tech people that really bring a level of technology uh, expertise to the community. You get artists and crafts people. You get great cooks and you get great gardeners, and you end up with a a really great place, and all of this builds social capital that everybody benefits from, and so does the out, the rest of the world. Sense of place is an important thing because people begin to realize that you know when you've got a great bunch of gardeners and you've got beautiful flowers and stuff right outside your door, you start to think, hey, this is a pretty neat place to live in. That it's a it's a balancing of privacy and community. That, uh, that's typical with, with co-housing, and, uh, and I'm sure it is with co-ops to a large extent. But it's sharing some really inviting living spaces, both in, indoor and outdoor living spaces. We're, we've programmed, in a, I will, as we'll show down the road, up to 8,000 square feet of, of common spaces for all kinds of things. Eating well is, is a big part of the concept here, uh, whether you're part of the cooking team or whether you're just showing up and, and uh, eating like you were at a restaurant. The food is good. We, we really eat well in co-housing. So here's what we see the co-living is really a combination of, of combining the, a co-op style, which could be uh, envisioned as really the co-opers will use the, the common areas probably even more than the co-housers will, and at least in terms of the cooking and eating facilities and that sort of thing. Uh, but they'll all share in them and, and use them from time to time and connect. Uh, it's really about a living an enriched uh, lifestyle. So now we'll get into, okay, what is what are we proposing here that might work? We've given some thought. Like I said, there's our initial program for this building, and it's not a very big building. It's on a quarter acre of land. 
uh, you know, it's setting right in the middle of a lot of other stuff that uh, is very walkable. But the common areas might include, you know, everything from the typical dining and cooking spaces. We call it the gourmet kitchen and dining, uh, to, to meeting rooms, uh, sitting rooms, uh, TV guest rooms where a guest can stay uh, on an overnight basis, uh, maybe some uh, some co-working spaces and, and uh, art maker spaces, a bike repair and storage, because we see bicycles as being a big piece of this, and, uh, and of course garden areas, maybe even a rooftop garden on it. We're, we're looking at uh, co-op private rooms ranging in 150 to 200 square foot of, of private living space, uh, maybe some shared co-op spaces that would be up to 400 square feet or more uh, where a family could have like two or, or more bedrooms and a private bath. Um, then in the co-housing, we're looking at uh, in, in the uh, one bedroom condominiums that are on the small size, 500 to 600 square feet, but cleverly designed, and I'll let Brian talk about that later when we get into showing you some of the very preliminary concepts we thought about. And then two bedroom one units from 700 to 900 square feet. These by today's standards are very small units, but when I started building houses, uh, we built single family houses in Boulder, sold them for $19,000, and they were for families of four people, two children and, and uh, mom and pop, 960 square feet, three bedroom ranch. And they worked really well. So you can do it. <laughs> you just have to get rid of some of your junk. So the, the sustainability program is a big piece of what we've envisioned, uh, which is a really a car free living. And, I, you know, the, the Lincoln and others have a, a better handle than I do on on how that really relates to your cost of living, but but it, there's significant savings if you can get rid of your car completely. This is a perfect site to experiment with that because there'll be all kinds of transportation options, everything from Ubers to bicycles to the RTDs right out the door. Uh, a lot of convenience. Uh, a lot of walkability. I mean, we're across the street from Whole Foods, Google, and, and the whole shopping center full of stuff and then movies. Uh, so we're after zero uh, net energy living, if we can get it through uh, the building with solar and, and geothermal for the energy and uh, high performance construction. So why why now? Why, why, why this? concept. We, we've been doing co-housing. Co-ops are, are finally broken into the co-housing. I guess come out of the uh, the dark side <laughs> of Boulder. They've been here for longer than, <laughs> than anybody alive in Boulder's been here. But we see the Boulder housing market is really, uh, you know, it's priced out, especially mid middle income housing options. And that's what we're really trying to hit with this. It's not uh, we, we've got a heavy affordable component in it, but we want a lot of diversity in the income range that will appeal. So we'll have market rate units, uh, small compact living units. Uh, it, it's a bit of an experiment, but people are actually living this way. This whole concept of mini homes, mini houses that is such so fashionable now, and everybody talks about it, and wouldn't that be cool to live in one? Well, guess what? You can have a mini apartment, and you can trick it out with the same kind of stuff. So that we just think the time is now to combine sustainability and affordability and, and, uh, and community all in, in one housing product. So this is getting into what does it cost? For those of you who might actually be interested in, in being part of it. Well, first of all, you gotta show up. So you've already passed one, the first test. Second, uh, you need to have a collaborative attitude and a reasonable tolerance for diversity because Anytime you get involved in community, and those of you that are already are, know somebody's going to piss you off, and uh, you've got to be able to deal with it, and you've got to be able to grow up and, and figure out how to get along with people. 
And then you, uh, eventually you got to decide to join a community and either rent or buy a home, you know, because you, you've got to be a real person that's going to move in here. We're not just you know, looking at, for people that have an uh, academic interest in it. So here's, here's uh, getting to the nuts and bolts of what it could cost. And this is uh, based off very preliminary budgeting, but a re reality, you know, we, we've got a strong team here between uh, Brian and Caddis Architecture, uh, Lincoln and all his program putting together uh, uh, co-op uh, communities and then uh, Wonderland's experience. So we think uh, we'll have co-op co units that would start maybe a little below 800,000. They would be affordable to people in the 45% of area median income range up to maybe 1,500 or, or possibly more a, a month for more market rate units to live there. Uh, the co-housing, one bedroom uh, co-housing units, 200 to 350,000. Some of them might be partially uh, uh, subsidized by the city's program and they, they would be under the, the city affordable program, but, uh, but there'd also be straight market rate ones that would not be affected by the pr program's um, deed restriction. Uh, and then two bedroom units from uh, 280 to 550. And these are just off the preliminary budget that we did. Okay, I'm gonna, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Brian, who can show you some initial concepts, and then we wanna kinda open it up to really get dialogue back. Who feels like they aren't real sure about what co-housing or co-ops is, or? Okay. Just the really quick rundown is, you know, um, like Jim said, co-housing is typically built of condos. The condos are complete with kitchens and baths and everything and are bought and sold as individual condominium properties. Um, and they share a common building and extensive common facilities. So Wild Sage is a co-housing project. Um, there's 34 homes on one and a half acres and we share a common house. The ground floor of this common house is about 2,700 square feet. We've got a kid's room. We share meals in here. We cook meals in this commercial kitchen. Uh, we've got a little brewery in here. Uh, there's a living room, hot tub roof deck over there, uh, wood shop that's really extensive and I'd love to show it off. Um, and in the basement, we've got two guest rooms. So when your in-laws come to town, they can be a little one degree separated from where you're at, um, and, uh, which is good for both sides of that conversation. Um, then we have a sort of a game family room downstairs, the big screen TV and foosball and stuff like that. Uh, yoga room where people can like work out and do yoga and whatever they want to do um, and then a community office um, uh, one last thing on wild sage so we we are 40 percent affordable which means that 40 percent of the homes here are part of the city of boulders income and deed restricted affordability program so we are extremely lucky and all around the country people look to us and say like how'd you make it work and the reality is like we made it work because the city has a program that allows us to make it work and then uh Typical, so we've done a bunch of co-op projects with BHC right now, and they're national leaders, I think, in the thinking around this, and they're really heroes here locally because there just aren't a lot of ways of getting that level of affordable housing to happen. So they're hitting really good affordability levels, partially because what they're selling, instead of like a square footage for a unit or for a home, which is a sort of like a certain American, um, you know, very money-oriented and quantified mindset, they're selling the experience of living there. So you get a bedroom and you get to live in this awesome place. That's really what we're selling at Wild Sage 2. You buy the community and you get a home with it. So we're trying to figure out how you mesh these two things together um, in one building in this case, which I think is a super interesting challenge. And we've been curious about it. How do you hybridize the two ideas? Um, at Wild Sage, the attempt that we've made is we've taken one of the bigger homes here in the middle that faces the green and that's become a co-op. So what we've tried to do is on the main floor of the, of the um, community, offer the sort of oranges the common spaces kind of dorm like or kind of like having a bedroom in a house you go out of that bedroom to do a lot of the other things cooking eating hanging out all the funs happening outside of your room and in uh, to put like the um, sort of most um, social engineering kind of hat on to talk when you're designing cups, you're often trying to squeeze the rooms as tight as possible to get people to involve with themselves with the community. And we can go back through these, but these are some of the renderings of the neighborhood that we're working in. It, and we sort of moved through that pretty quickly. It's a dense urban neighborhood. So everything's four and five stories. 
Um, the streets are tight. There's no surface parking throughout the entire neighborhood. Um, it's at 30th and Pearl here in Boulder. Um, and this is a project that we've worked on for a number of years in different um, ways. And we're optimistic that we might get another bite of this apple to see if we can make it happen here. We tend to bundle the cost of owning a car with the cost of having a house, which for people who don't want to have a car, it saddles them with a burden that they don't need to have. So the city of Boulder now has adopted a, a principle they called sump principles, which means that all parking has to be shared. So it's shared between residential and commercial and retail and offices and whatever. All parking has to be unbundled, which means it has to be sold separately from the home. So you can have a parking spot, but you just have to buy it separately, which is what we did here at Wild Sage 20 years ago, kind of quite early in that process. Um, and let's see, shared, unbundled, managed means, means there's got to be an entity like controlling it, observing it, and making sure it's working. Um, that's frankly a way for the city to um, trigger fees for themselves. Um, and P is paid, so you got to pay for the thing that you're using. So if um, you have a retail shop and people are coming to buy ice cream from you and they're bringing a car, they got to pay for their share of having a car spot available for them. So it's a very like anti suburban strip mall kind of mentality, but it does mean that like you, if you do need to have a car, you absolutely can have a car. There's um, great bus access here. There's great regional bus access here to Denver and beyond. And then there's also going to be a series of car share programs. And it probably wouldn't address what you're doing. I don't know much about it yet. But um, it can mean that a couple might have one car instead of two. Or somebody might be able to get away with no car and just use that now and then. The beautiful thing about what's happening in the future of car sharing is that I will have a membership to a car and I'll pay a hundred bucks a month instead of 800 bucks a month um, or two thousand dollars a month which is what it costs to build a garage and store a car in it and have it be my own car that nobody else touches to being like oh this weekend I need the pickup truck this weekend I need to drive to DA and I'd love to use the electric car this weekend I gotta um, take a road trip to New Mexico so I gotta buy a, or use a car that's fuel efficient but doesn't need to be re-powered um, along the way it needs to run off of fuel so it gives you a lot more freedom in what kind of car you get um, and it gives you the freedom to not have a car at all, which is kind of cool. But it's also, this isn't so dogmatic that uh, car ownership is viewed as a bad thing. It's just sort of like treats it a little bit differently. Uh, we're going to have car share on site here. Uh, and just to make sure that your question got answered, you can buy into the shared district parking. $90 a month is a number that was thrown out uh, for how much that costs. I don't know. Uh, if that's the final number. Um, but there is a shared district parking already there at 30th and Pearl. It, the, it already exists. Um, so we don't hope, we hope to add zero more parking places. Um, but uh, the average uh, cost to make new parking is $250 a month going forward or 300 uh, per spot. Um, so I know people expect parking to be free, but I can tell you it is not free to build. So uh, just be aware of that. Check out Shoops, the high cost of free parking, if you want to learn about how parking fucks everything. Um, but uh, in terms of this project, uh, we really want to encourage alternative modes. We've come to the end of our time, but we're thinking, you know, we've got some food and some drinks, so maybe we can just have a roundabout uh, informal discussions with folks. Get to know each other. You might be living together.